So thank you very much. Let me go straight to the session. I always begin with a summary of uh, the purpose of this training. The purpose of the discipleship training program is to train members to be disciples, disciple makers and trainers of disciple makers. And it's our hope that when we train members to be disciples, we will grow the vision and mission of Christ in every church by helping members to personalize and localize that mission and vision. We hope also to achieve this in two ways. Number one, by repositioning or making discipleship the primary mission of every church, minister and member. And number two, by showing what discipleship is about, why discipleship is important, and how true discipleship happens. So in that one slide, we have captured two things, the purposes of this discipleship training program and the process by which we hope to achieve that purpose. So far, we have been able to establish what discipleship is about. I'm gonna I have to exit this and come back. Uh, I think I'm on a different slide. Give me a minute. Give me one minute. I was on a different PowerPoint. Yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. So this is the purpose of the discipleship training program. And that is the process we are following. What have we established so far? We have established what discipleship is about. It's about being the disciple of Christ and making others his disciples. The true disciple of Christ is someone who lives, reflects, and represents the life of Christ. Disciples live and reflect Christ by abiding in Christ and by allowing Christ to abide in them. Abiding allows the disciple to look and listen to Christ so as to learn of Christ and from Christ. And it's only when we learn from Jesus that we can live for Christ and lead others to Christ. And there are some simple disciplines or routines that help disciples to learn from Christ. And these are memorizing and meditating on the words of Christ and on the works of Christ in Scripture. This is why I encourage everyone to memorize at least every week. Try to memorize something of Christ's words and works. And as you meditate, what you do is to mine the gems in them. And through this, the Holy Spirit is able to help us live and respond to that life. So we've established what discipleship is about. What we have also established is why is discipleship important? There are three reasons why discipleship is important for the church today. And by the way, let me try to qualify. In the New Testament, the church is not a building. The church is not a doctrine it's not a denomination the church is always people you me us together so when we talk about the reason why discipleship is important to the church we want to look at the church first of all in a corporate way and also in a personal way so discipleship was the mission of christ and the mission of the new testament church so we, we read jesus came to seek and save the lost those who responded to his preaching and teaching, Jesus discipled them. And we notice as he, before he left to go to heaven, he said, go make disciples. Discipleship is the official mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it is the first work of the church board. Church manual, page 129. But this is the other key point that I want to build on today. Discipleship makes the church obedient to God's vision. Discipleship makes the church obedient to God's vision. So besides being the mission of Christ, it is only as disciples that we can be obedient to God's vision. So what is God's vision for the church today? What is God's plan for the church today? God's vision for the church is to be a priesthood of faithful worshipers a family of fellowshipping friends, and a fearless army of fruitful witnesses. So this is the ultimate goal for Christ. The church is to become 
faithful worshipers, a family of faithful worshipers, a family of fruitful witnesses. Look to the last statement. It says very clearly, only as disciples can the church be a family of worshipers and witnesses. So if we don't grow as disciples of Christ, we cannot experience the full plan of God for our lives. So God's vision, once again, is to make the church a priesthood of faithful worshipers, a family of fellowshipping friends, and a fearless army of fruitful witnesses. So the last time I shared this, this presentation, we ended up with a question. Is your church providing for its members an experience of true, meaningful, faithful worship? If the church is, how, when, and how? Is your church providing all its members an experience of authentic fellowship? If your church is, how and when? And finally, is your church providing an opportunity for all her members to experience fruitful witnessing that makes them disciple makers? If your church is providing, when and how? The truth, my brothers and sisters, is this. Many Seventh-day Adventist churches don't provide for an experience of God's full vision. We do well when it comes to worship, yet we don't have provisions for authentic fellowship or fruitful witnessing. There is some good news. There is one Adventist program that helps to grow the full vision of God for the church. And that program is the Sabbath school. You see, so I want to find out how well do you know your Sabbath school? How, do you, how well do you know the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath school? How well do you know the purposes of Adventist Sabbath school? How well do you know the best practices to bring about all the purposes of Sabbath school? So let's find out how well you know your Sabbath school. Uh, I'm sorry I may not have told you this, but we needed you to have a little piece of paper. If you can grab a piece of paper and a pen, I have about five questions. All of them are multiple choices. So grab a pen and a piece of paper and see how well you know the history of your church. So let me give you one minute. Take one minute to know how well you know the history of your church. So the first question is this. Who wrote the first Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lesson? You have four names there. John Bington, James White, Uriah Smith, Ellen White. Who wrote the first Sabbath School lesson for the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Okay, let's see whether you got your answer right. The first Sabbath School was written by James White. Second question, in what periodical were the first Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lessons published? We never had Sabbath School lessons in the way we have them in booklets. They were published in Sabbath in our periodicals. In which periodical were the first Sabbath School lessons published? The Youth Instructor, Review and Herald, The Midnight Cry, or Signs of the Times? You have a minute to choose one answer. The correct answer is Youth Instructor. Began in 1878, what was the name of the first children's Sabbath school division? The Bird's Nest, The Seedling's Corner, Little Believers, Young Scholars. The correct answer is The Bird's Nest. Next question. What ship funded entirely from Sabbath school offering, took the gospel to the South Sea in 1890. What missionary ship funded entirely from Sabbath school offering, took the gospel, the Good Hope, the Pit Cane, the Midnight Cry, the missionary. The Pit Cane. If you know anything about the Pit Cane Islands, they are entirely Adventist, the whole island, everyone is an Adventist on the island because in 1890, 
the gospel was taken there through this missionary ship. Next question, what Bible book has been the most frequent topic for the adult Bible study guide? In other words, which book of the Bible have we read more than any other in our adult Sabbath school lesson guide? Psalms, Daniel, Acts of Apostles, or Revelation? The correct answer is the Acts of Apostles. The Acts of Apostles is the book that outlines how the church began, how the church continued after Christ's time. And in this book, we are able to see how the Holy Spirit worked and how the Holy Spirit wants to continue working in the church today. Finally, since its earliest organization, what have been the objective of Sabbath school? Fellowship, outreach, Bible study, or mission? The true answer is all of, the, all of them. So the purposes of Sabbath school are three. There are three purposes of Sabbath school. Bible study and prayer for spiritual nurture, fellowship, and then mission. But mission in two phases. Number one, community outreach, and number two, global mission. The majority of Sabbath school programs in many of our churches only facilitate two of the purposes of Sabbath school. And these are Bible study and prayer and then world mission. Many times when we come together for Sabbath school, the two things we do out of the three purposes of Sabbath school, out of the four purposes of Sabbath school, we spend a lot of time studying scripture and prayer, which is commendable. And then the next thing that most Sabbath schools do is we have a report of what is happening elsewhere. We miss out in fellowship and we miss out in community outreach. And because of that, we do not have a holistic experience of Sabbath school. I want you to understand all Sabbath school objectives are intended to grow God's vision. In other words, Bible study makes the church a faithful, makes, the, makes a church of faithful worshipers. Fellowship makes the church a family of friends. And witnessing makes the church an army of fruitful disciples, disciple makers. So when we do not facilitate all the objectives, we miss out in experiencing God's full vision for the church. Number two, Sabbath school is intended to grow three relationships. Number one, our relationship with God. Number two, our relationship with other disciples. And number three, our relationship with others who are not yet full disciples. So when we do not actively facilitate all the objectives of Sabbath school, then we do not have a holistic healthy growth as it is intended. What is Christ's vision for your Sabbath school? The servant of the Lord in Councils to Sabbath School, page 10, writes the following. The Sabbath school should be one of the greatest instruments and the most effective in bringing souls to Christ and growing them to be like Jesus. Hear me again. The Sabbath school should be the greatest instrumentality and the most effective in bringing souls to Jesus and growing them to be like Jesus. So let me give you a little exercise. On a scale of one to three, one being poor, two being average, and three being good, how does your church score in bringing people to Christ? So take your Sabbath school program. In this last year, how successful has your Sabbath school program been in bringing people to Jesus? The majority of our Sabbath school perform either one or sometimes below one. But our Sabbath school is supposed to be the place where people are brought to Christ. Secondly, how does your church score in growing people to be like Jesus? Even when we don't bring them, are we proactively growing them to be like Christ? This is God's vision for Sabbath school. 
Testimony to Sabbath School, page 74. The Lord desires that those who are engaged, those who attend the Sabbath School work, should be missionaries, able to go forth to the towns and villages that surround the church and give the light of life to those who sit in darkness. In other words, everyone who attends Sabbath School is a missionary. Once we have finished Sabbath school, we have finished worship or part of the Sabbath school should be to go to the homes that surround the church, surround our place of worship so that we can give light to those who are still in darkness. So the question I want to ask is this, how are you as a church going to the community around your church? How does your Sabbath school facilitate an opportunity so that everyone in attendance can be able to facilitate, to engage and communicate and share the gospel with those around the church. At the beginning of this year, I had the opportunity to share and do a training program for the Swindon Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I shared with them how the Sabbath school program, the Sabbath school classes can become the most effective instrument in connecting the church with the community. I suggested and recommended a number of ways in which their Sabbath school could be able to be used to connect with the community. After I had shared, they were very convicted about that, that they decided the following Sabbath, they were going to do something. So in the middle of the week, the Sabbath school superintendent, the PM leader, and a number of elders, they went around the church and wrote down all the streets around the church, how many homes were in each street. And when Sabbath came, the 11th of January, when church members, Sabbath school members met at 10 o'clock, they were welcomed and invited to participate in a different program. And the recommendation was that that Sabbath, instead of doing the normal Sabbath school, they were going to use that time to mingle with their neighbors to minister to them in prayer. You remember it was during the 10 days of prayer and fasting that we start with as a, as a global church. So what they did is to pair the members up. They assigned every pair 20 homes and suggested to them to do something very simple. Go and knock at the door, introduce yourself. This is Michael and this is Kigundu. We are, we are members of the church down the corner. Today we have a special prayer day for our community and all we are doing is to collect any prayer request that you have and they would write down the prayer request and so they went out there from 10 30 to 11 o'clock just for half an hour and then met back at 11 o'clock they spent 15 minutes sharing their experiences and then they spent another 15 minutes interceding for their community for their neighbors and I was so in, in, encouraged because their commitment was every first Sabbath of the month, instead of doing a normal Sabbath school, what they planned to do is every first Sabbath of the month, they will be going to different homes around the church just to be able to intercede for them as a way of mingling, as a way of ministering to them faith-wise. And I would like to suggest to you that every Sabbath school class can be assigned a section in the community. And one of the things they can be asked to do is something very simple. Why don't you just minister to them in prayer and pray with them? So Sabbath school can be the place for us to be able to learn. What does Sabbath school train us? The servant of the Lord continues ministry of healing. Every church should be a training school for Christian workers. Its members should be taught how to give Bible readings how to conduct and teach Sabbath school, how best to help the poor and care for the sick. But I want you to catch the last line, how to work for the unconverted. And those of you who joined us last session, we were able to look at how does the church make disciples in the community. We highlighted a number of practical things. Number one, make friends, mingle to make friendship. Minister. And we minister in a number of ways. We can minister through prayer. We can minister through acts of kindness. We can minister through formal or informal learning. So 
this is what the ways we work in the community. So every church should be a training school for Christian workers. Its members should be taught how to work for the unconverted. And I'm hoping that this discipleship training, apart from affirming your faith and transforming your faith, will become the means by which each of us will commit for ongoing training so that we can become effective disciple makers. So this is what we recommend. Every Sabbath school class should have a minimum of 50 minutes. But that 50 minutes should not all be spent in uh, the study of scripture, no. The first 10 minutes of Sabbath school should be spent in caring, in fellowship, sharing and caring. The next 30 minutes should be spent in spiritual nurture, a reflective relational study of scripture. And the last 10 minutes of every class should be spent in mission. The class becomes an action team for mission to the community, mission to their friends, mission to their family, and mission to the world. So fellowship. The first 10 minutes of every Sabbath school class should be a time of fellowship. Why is fellowship important? Because fellowship made the New Testament church to become a family of friends. You recall the words of Jesus Christ in John 15, 15, where Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends because everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus has called us to be his friends and he wants us to be a family of friends. What makes us friends is fellowship. What makes us friends is fellowship. In the New Testament, it is fellowship that made the church friends. We read in Acts 2, 42 to 47, that they devoted their, themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So the, early test, the New Testament church spent time in worship. They spent time in Bible study, but they also spent time in quality fellowship. What is quality fellowship about? Fellowship is about three things. Number one, it's about coming together. It's about letting go my desire to just be by myself and making time to be in the company of others. It's about associating. And Paul tells us in Hebrews 10 verse 25, do not neglect the gathering of the saints as is the habit of some. So make every effort to gather together where the brethren are allow yourself make an effort to be there the second element of fellowship is about sharing and caring so it is one thing to come together but we must be willing to share our experiences and to care for one another and the third element of fellowship is the commitment to build each other to encourage each other to comfort each other so fellowship allows us to experience and exercise unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, unconditional forgiveness. That is the place where we learn how to share and show God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's goodness. So how does fellowship happen at Sabbath school class? This is what happens for us to foster fellowship at Sabbath school class. Class members build relationship by spending the first 10 minutes sharing and caring and praying for one another. So my suggestion for every Sabbath school teacher is this. When you start the Sabbath school class, ask members to spend the first five minutes just visiting with one another. So I would always recommend turn to the person next to you. Share with them what was your most memorable experience this week. Number two, what was the most challenging experience you had this week? So if I'm sitting next to Pastor Kigundu, I will share with Pastor Kigundu my most memorable and most challenging experiences. Pastor Kigundu will share with me his most memorable and his most challenging. And then after we share, then we care for one another. We pray for one another. We affirm each other. Once we spend the five minutes sharing between each other, then I would always ask the question, 
has there anybody is there anybody who would like to share with us their experience for the week and if there is a member who has had a very challenging experience in the week then we use that time as a class to minister to them friends if you come together and somebody and, and, and the devil has been on, on the case of one of our members and he has battered the member throughout the week. Even if you don't study the lesson, but you can effectively minister to that person, you have achieved much more than anything else. So it is important that we as a class manage to know how to care for one another. So the class members spend the first 10 minutes sharing with one another, caring for one another. As a class, it's important to create a safe environment. Train people to know to be confidential so that you encourage a feeling, an exchange of feelings and opinion and encourage openness and honesty. Class members get involved in ministering according to their spiritual gifts, their passions and their personality. So when you are as a class and any one member is challenged, on issues of maybe learning, and you're good at that. Another person is struggling, maybe with issues of finances, and you are good at helping on that. Somebody else is struggling with issues of children. So as a class, we can be able to share with one another. And number four, class members look out for the absent. So not only do we care for one another, we also try to find out who didn't make it to our class today. We pray for them. Not only do we pray for them, we then task who is going to check out on the person who did not come. So if a member does not come to class for two Sabbaths, then that Sabbath, the second Sabbath afternoon, there's, there's no reason why we shouldn't be knocking at their door, finding out what is happening to them. So Sabbath school is the place where we can be able to care, to share, and to be able to support each other. Fellowship at Sabbath school grows the church to be a family of friends. Point number two, mission at Sabbath school grows the church to be a church of disciple makers. And when we think of mission, we think of mission in two ways. Most of us know the global mission that is read of what God is doing in many other places. What I want to emphasize today is about what we call community outreach. Every class should be involved in a mission into their community. This is what Jesus said, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. When they had followed him for three and a half years, before he ascended to heaven, he said, now, after you have been trained, go make disciples of all the nations, teach them to observe. And he had promised them that they would get, they will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. So how does mission at Sabbath school, grow disciple makers. Class members attending the same class develop prayer partners to pray and plan to disciple each other's families and friends. So the first type of prayer that I prayed with Pastor Kigund was about caring for him and him caring for me. Now we partnership not to care for ourselves, but to care for the people in our lives. I have family members who are not yet disciples of Christ. I have colleagues at work who are not yet disciples of Christ. I have neighbors. This is one time where I am able to share with Kigundu. Kigundu is able to share with me. And then we pray together for these people. And next, not only do we pray for them, we follow God's spirit in reaching out to them intentionally and prayerfully befriending them and working as a team for their salvation. So you notice that the salvation of my family, my friends, is, not so, is no longer my sole responsibility. Instead, it becomes a teamwork. They extend Sabbath school outside Sabbath school time, each class occasionally getting together for social events where they can invite their friends. So I have individuals I'm working with to bring them to Jesus. You have individuals you're working with to bring them to Jesus. If once a quarter, as a Sabbath school class, we have a fellowship lunch or have an ev afternoon event, we can invite our friends there. So I can introduce you to my friends. You can introduce me to your friends. 
So if these people for any reason come to church, and even if I am not there, they have been able to grow a network of friends. So at Sabbath school class, we can be able to build that. Class members get involved in meeting the needs in their local community. Each class is an action unit with a mission to the community. So notice, as I shared with you about Swindon, every Sabbath school class was assigned a section next to the church. And that was their mission field to work in that mission field. You see, our goal should be to become not a church in the community, or not just a church in the community, but a church for the community. Many of our churches are simply churches in the community. We have to become a church for the community, a church of the community, and not just a church in the community. That should be your goal. As a church there in, at the university, you must be a church for that university. You must be a church for that community, not just a church in that community. And finally, the efficient mission appeal of what is happening locally and in distant lands. It is great to hear what God is doing in India, what God is doing in Papua New Guinea, what God is doing in other places. But it will be greater if every now and again, once or twice a month, we have a mission report of what God is doing in our community using our Sabbath school members and our Sabbath school classes. So every Sabbath school class must become an action team, an army battalion that has a big mission in the community. And finally, Bible study and prayer grow members to become faithful worshipers. The reason we study our Bible, the reason we pray is not just for information, it is for transformation. What did Jesus promise? John chapter 4, 23 and 24. The hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What is the content of the everlasting gospel? Fear God and give him glory for the hour of judgment has come. Worship him. So we have a mission, not only to call the world to worship the true God, but we must model for the world what true worship is by becoming true worshipers. And that is the role of Bible study. So Bible study and prayer grow faithful worshipers. How does Bible study and prayer grow faithful worshipers? Point number one, members read the Bible daily and weekly. Let me re-emphasize this. Members read the Bible daily and weekly. We don't read the Sabbath school lesson. The Sabbath school lesson is a guide to the Bible. Our goal is that we become acquainted with scripture because it is scripture that helps us to come to know Jesus. So they memorize the key verses. They seek to answer the following questions through discussion and prayer. Number one, what does this text actually say? What did this text actually say and mean to the first readers? If you have read your Sabbath school lesson for this quarter, this week, it has highlighted that text without context is a very good pretext for your own personal opinion. Every time we read a scripture text, it is important to establish the context. If you take scripture without context, you provide yourself a good pretext for imposing your own opinions. So it is important for us, first of all, to understand what is the context of the scripture. But beyond what actually was said and what was done, these are the questions we need to answer. What do we learn about God? What do we learn about humanity? What do we feel about God and about humanity? Especially about myself. Question number four. What will we do in prayer? What will we do in practice? And question number five, number six, with who will you share 
what I have read. So every week when you read your scripture, one of the things I encourage people is memorize the key verses of scripture. Once you have memorized the key verses of scripture, that scripture together with the other chapters you read, be able to sit back at the end of the week and ask yourself, what did I learn about God? What did I learn about humanity and myself? What did I learn about salvation? What did I learn about the great controversy? Number, B, number two, they pray and strive to make Jesus central to everything, seeking to reflect his love and life to people who attend and those in their lives. So once we have read the scripture, so this week we have been reading the book of Hebrews chapter 11. What did we learn about God? What did we learn about ourselves? How do we feel about God and about ourselves in light of our learning? What are we going to do in prayer? What are we going to do in practice? And our goal is to reflect Jesus in all that we do. And number three, Teachers encourage everyone to contribute to the discussion, helping class members learn from one another as they explore the Bible together. And finally, they encourage each other to share their learning with others in their lives, friends, family, and all who are willing to hear. So whatever we are going to learn, let us look forward to share it with other people. So this week, let me just give you a little summary. This week, our memory verse was Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. So this whole quarter, our emphasis is about how to interpret scripture. And this week in particular, we have been looking at how, why is interpretation needed? And we established that all of us come to scripture with some presuppositions. So it is in translation and interpretation that we are able to understand what actually happened, what is the true meaning. And it's also a way of helping us to be able to know what is our true condition and what God has done for us. So this is just a summary of our lesson for this week and how Sabbath school when properly organized, can become a means by which we grow as worshippers. So that was our memory verse for this week. And what I want you to ask yourself is, at the end of every study, what did you learn about God? What did we learn about God this week? We learned that God rewards those who diligently seek him. What did we learn about humanity? When you read the whole chapter, you learned about people who have trusted God and God has come through for them. So how do we feel about God? We feel very confident, very excited that we serve a faithful God. What do we feel about people? We feel anxious about people because people fail. But more importantly, you can see people who trust. What are we going to do in prayer? What are we going to do in practice? Our prayer or my prayer this week is how to be faithful like those who have gone before me. What is going to be my practice? To make sure that not only do I know what the passage says, but I can be able to identify other important questions that help me to know the meaning of it. But ultimately, even as I read every day, my great prayer to the Lord is this, help me to share with another what I have learned from you. So always grow a holistic Sabbath school experience for your church. Don't be content with a portion or an experience of one aspect. Instead, I want to encourage each of you, always endeavor so that you can be able to have a holistic experience. Sabbath school, while fully facilitated with all its objective, is one of the best places and the best programs to help each of us become faithful worshipers, to have authentic fellowship, and to become fruitful witnesses. So let us reflect on Sabbath school briefly. How has Sabbath school helped you become a disciple and a disciple maker? How can we help each other and the church to reflect God's vision for our Sabbath school? And finally, 
what for you has changed through this training. This is my prayer for you. Lift him up. Tis he that bids you, let the dying look and live. To a weary thirsting sinner, living waters will he give. And though once so meek and lowly, yet the prince of heaven was he. And the blind who grope in darkness through the blood of Christ shall see. Lift him up, tis he that bids you. Let the dying look and live. To a weary thirsting sinners, living waters will he give. And the one so meek and lowly, yet the prince of heaven was see. And the blind who grope in darkness, through the blood of Christ shall see. Lift him up, the risen Savior, I am made the waiting throng. Lift him up, this he that speaketh, now he bids you free from wrong. Lift him up, the precious Savior, let the multitude behold. They with willing heart shall seek him, he will draw them to his fold. They will gather from the wayside, hasting on with joyful faith. They shall bear the cross of Jesus, and shall find salvation for him. Lift him up, the risen Savior, I am amid the waiting throng. Lift him up, this he that speaketh, now he bids you free from wrong. Lift him up in all his glory, is the Son of God on high. Lift him up, his love shall draw them, in the care his children him. Let them hear again the story of the cross, the death of shame, and from tongue to tongue repeat it, mighty throng shall bless his name. Lift him up, the risen Savior, I am mid the waiting throng. Lift him up, the sea that speaketh, now he bids you free from wrong. Amen.